Welcome to LA Book Fest 2020, and today's panel is Power Pitching Your Manuscript or Screenplay. Um, we are all book fans, and as our host, Desiree Duffy, is fond of saying, let's get bookish. And, of course, being book fans, there are some of us who write or intend to write, and so it, it being Hollywood, power pitching and getting stories onto the screen is something of a uh, of a preoccupation. So I've got some experts with me this morning. I've got Bob D'Onofrio, uh, Cheryl DeForio. Baker. Oh, DeForio, Bob DeForio. You know, I should have known that from your um, from from your acronym, and I'm going to talk about that. Uh, Bob DeForio. Cheryl Benko, and Paul Levine. Uh, Bob DeForio is founder and principal agent of D4EO Literary Agency. That is a letter D, a numeral four, an E and an O, so he cribbed his license plate. <laughs> and he's currently with New American Library, Dutton Penguin, USA, where he helped launch the paperback careers of, oh, newbies, Erica Jong, Robin Cook, Stephen King, Ken Follett, and Robert Tannenbaum. He, I guess he made those superstars. Um, okay, then also Cheryl Benko is a screenwriter, post-production supervisor, and author of the humorous novel, The Last of Will. She holds a Bachelor of Arts in Communication with emphasis in film and television from the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs. And she's worked on more than 30 films, including the Netflix release Between Two Ferns. She's currently working as post-production supervisor for Alan Ball on Uncle Frank, and with Catherine Hardwick on Don't Look Deeper for the new streaming prep platform, which we're going to want to know more about, Quibi. Paul Levine is founder of the Paul S. Levine Literary Agency and an entertainment attorney. He's practiced entertainment law for over 35 years. And in 1996, he opened the Paul S. Levine Literary Agency, specify, specializing in television rights in and to books. He's sold more than 150 fiction and nonfiction books to at least 50 publishers and has had many books developed as movies for television and feature film. I'm Gerald Everett Jones. I'm your moderator, uh, host of Get Published Radio, getpublishedradio.com, and an author myself, uh, struggling self-publisher, as it were. So, Bob, could you start this off with telling us what, what is the difference between a pitch and a query? The difference between a pitch and a query. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, well, I, mean, I would think I, a query I, I, would be to an agent would be from a from a book writer to an agent, and a pitch would be perhaps to a, a movie producer yeah, or or yeah. an agent pitching to a publisher. Yeah, yeah. A query would be when an author writes. Uh, a literary agent and describes a work that they've written and asks for uh, asks for representation. A pitch would be when the agent signs that author and goes out and submits it to publishers. Right. So it's, it's uh, might we say that a query would like will likely be written and a pitch would likely be verbal or. In the old um, days, that would be the case. In the old right. days. See, well, that's how things have changed. Everything's, right? digi everything's digital. <laughs> everything's email, huh? It, it really is. Yes, okay. And, and we're, we're proving that today, I guess. <laughs> so, Cheryl, in today's digital marketplace, mm -hmm. how, do, how would you think new agents... No, <laughs> new agents. <laughs> new agents, so, yeah, that's changing too. How, how would new talent get discovered? Well, a lot of people that I know um, in the film industry will specifically have their own YouTube channels that they can put. Um, some people I know have done actual trailers, what they call trailers for their projects. If it's something they're developing, they'll shoot um, uh, just a, a, a few uh, scenes or what would be setups for scenes that they then comprise into basically like a trailer, like you would see in a, in a, a theater um, to sort of present their project and to get people excited and interested. Um, a lot of other people, um, certainly aspiring filmmakers and even some established filmmakers will, 
will go through the the route of crowdfunding or um, GoFundMe, and they'll use social media as a way to get people excited uh, about their project. And also, with those platforms, it's an opportunity for the average person who is outside of the film industry to feel like they're actively a part of it, like they can contribute and they can be someone who gets the movie made and have even uh, their name in the credits at the end. So it's sort of an exciting way to get people engaged. And a lot of um, producers and production companies will look at um, social media. They'll look for uh, self-published short stories. Um, they'll, they'll look for things that are getting a lot of traction on social media that people are talking about. And uh, so, so a lot of work that's out there in digital platforms, you never know who's going to see it. And um, it could end up being someone who, who is ultimately very interested in your project at the end of the day. So it's about building a platform, isn't it? it it's like everything, I think, in, in any form <laughs> of uh, publicity or salesmanship to get people aware of your brand and aware of your work and, and get it, yeah. as many eyes on it as you can. Yeah, so if you think somebody else is going to do it for you, you better think again, right? <laughs> if you, well, my feeling is if you go through all the work to write a screenplay or to write a book or you put all that investment in it, then the person you should most trust to get behind it is yourself. Because if you're not Absolutely. supportive of it, nobody else is going to be. Absolutely. So, so, so Paul, so, coming back to pitching, uh, I, yes, let me I ask this. Can I jump this. in and try to answer the first question? Well, uh, yeah, this is related to that, so maybe you'll think of it as a follow-on. When it comes to pitching, I'm interested in who does what to whom. We're talking about author, okay. agent, producer, and for what purpose. And that's and there maybe there's more than one. Okay, so um, a pitch is uh, like a synopsis of a book or a synopsis of a screenplay. It's the thing that's used to get somebody else interested in whatever it is, a book, a screenplay, a movie, et cetera, a published novel, whatever it may be. The pitch is part of the query letter. The uh, query letter is specifically for authors to uh, attempt to get representation by an agent. Um, and a query letter is for screenwriters to attempt to get representation by an agency which represents screenwriters and television writers. Um, so the pitch is part of the query letter. It's like the second, first or second paragraph of the query letter, but it's simply one part of it. The pitch is used at every stage of the process. It is used by an author or by a screenwriter to attempt to get representation, as I said. It is used by the pitchee, the person to whom the pitch is being made, uh, to... Uh, evaluate whether representation is going to be offered, to evaluate whether um, the uh, pitchy is going to want to work with uh, the pitcher, uh, et cetera. And then once representation is done, then I turn around and use some version of the pitch that I originally received from the book author to attempt to interest acquiring editors at publishing houses or executives at studios or production companies, if it's a movie, uh, et cetera. So the pitch is, and then at the end of the day, the pitch is also going to get used by uh, the next level to the next level. So the studio is going to, or the production company is going to pitch the network or the cable channel or the streaming service. The uh, acquiring editor at the book publisher is going to use the pitch to get the buyers at Barnes and Noble, at Amazon, at Target, Costco, and Walmart interested in carrying and selling uh, the book. So the pitch is used at every stage of the process. Okay. Okay, Bob. Well, Bob, if you'd follow up with that on, then how would you support one of your clients in terms of the pitching process, learning how to pitch or coaching them on pitching or advising them when to pitch or who to pitch to? 
Well, we wouldn't be advising them who to pitch to. It's, it's the agent who does the pitching, not the client. Okay. okay. Uh, in, ter okay. in terms of the pitch itself, um, I probably want to edit it in some way, uh, spruce it up or, or whatever. Um, but at that point, then it's my job to go out and find the right editor at the right publishing house and try and get them interested. Okay. Okay. So then the essence of that original email query then can become the core of the pitch that you're going to use. Would that be right? It certainly would be. Yeah. Yeah. So, so starting with, I would think a good synopsis, a good concise synopsis, a hard hitting synopsis. And then as Cheryl, Cheryl, from what you're saying, it sounds as though in this digital realm, we may also have a YouTube clip appended to that, or we're drawing their attention to that, or? Uh, I, I think for certain projects, that could be a, an addendum to the actual pitch, because if you're, if you're uh, trying to pitch um, certainly a screenplay um, or a book to be transitioned to film, any, any visual representation of that medium, I think is, can be helpful. It doesn't mean that it's that it's absolutely necessary because it, it's time and money to create something visual yeah. like a uh, like a trailer. Um, but if you have the resources to do it, you you know people who can help you. Um, I think there's even just as an experiment, just to see how the story translates to a visual medium. It can be extremely helpful um, to to know, even if nobody ever sees it except you. It's just like when uh, when actors get together to do a table read of a script, hearing it spoken out loud. And I've I've been at table reads over the years on movies I've worked on, hearing it it acted out and and um, and spoken is a, is a different experience than reading it on the page. And so, I, I think with any sort of literary work be it a book, a, a screenplay, um, you know, you have to be cognizant of how is it going to translate to a different medium if, if you want it to be something that does transcend uh, beyond just one form. And, and so, I know Facebook loves video. I mean, in terms of... Yeah, and, and, um, and YouTube, you can set up your own channel. It doesn't, it doesn't cost anything. And, and you can put, uh, you know, I have a, a little trailer that we made for my book on my YouTube channel. And it was something that a friend and I put together um, just a, as, as a little promotional video for it. And um, again, I think any time you, you wanna create something that, that you feel can take life as another medium, explore how it will translate to that other medium to see if it's viable before you would try to pitch it as something that could be turned into a movie or a screenplay. Now, when did that happen for your book? At what point in the process? Had you finished the manuscript and your, how, how, did, how yeah. did your marketing go? Um, well, I had, I had already self-published my, my novel. And then my friend and I, um, because I work in the film industry, I know people who um, could help me with those aspects. A friend of, of mine, uh, actually my cover artist, Leon Jusen, who's an amazing artist, uh, he's an animation director. And so... Uh, I came up with this little uh, pitch for just a, a one minute promo video of of the uh, goat and the cow on the cover of the book talking uh, about what the book is about and their curiosity of it. And we did this this little video with just conversation bubbles between the the goat and the cow. And uh, it was just something fun that that I've put on social media. And we've got, again, up on the YouTube channel. And it just kind of gives it a, a, just a different uh, introduction uh, for people, just as a compliment to showing them just the book itself. Well, like Bob says, it's a new age. I can remember back in the days when they, you know, they were coaching the guild members about, okay, you're going to walk into the producer's office and they're going to mm -hmm. offer you a bottle of water yeah. and you better make sure you wear a sport coat. Yeah. <laughs> so and that's all changed. And, and uh, if I could just say, I've done those meetings where I've gone into the, uh, uh, I had one screenplay that went out as a spec that got a lot of meetings all over town. And I had to take those meetings with development executives. And it is, it's, it's very much uh, an approach that you practice about 
they always invariably ask you, how did this story come to you? You kind of, you know, learn the questions that you're going to get asked over and over again. So you do, it's, it's like you're pitching in the room, even though they've already read the material and obviously liked it enough to invite you there. So Paul, let's back up a bit. Mm -hmm. um, it has been said, uh, and it may be true still or not, uh, that fiction must be submitted to an agent or editor as a complete manuscript, mm -hmm. whereas nonfiction must be submitted as an outline and sample chapters. But what well, not an outline. We're called a book proposal. Capital okay. P, capital P. A book proposal is a lot more than just a chapter-by-chapter -chapter outline of the nonfiction book. Um, the most important sections of the book proposal, for example, are... The about the author section, why the author is an expert on his or her topic, uh, how the author is going to get out there and flog the book, etc. Um, and the comparative book section, which discusses how and why the proposed book is different from and better than all of the other uh, books still currently in print that are out there. Now, what I'd like to say is that the purpose of the book proposal for a nonfiction book is to show everybody at every stage of the process that there's a hole in the marketplace and that the author is the one with the shovel who can fill that hole. For a, for a fiction, a complete manuscript, polished, perfect, ready to publish. Nothing, no typos, no grammatical errors, uh, not the first draft, not the second draft, not even the third draft. I want it when it's ready to present when it shines and it's perfect and it's ready to present to the acquiring editors at the publishing houses. So um, once you're an established author, you can sell your next book, uh, your next fiction uh, book based on a partial. You don't need a complete manuscript. But to get started as a, as a first time author, as an aspiring author, a complete polished, ready to publish manuscript. For nonfiction, it's a book proposal. And then depending on the agent, some agents, I like one sample chapter. Bob, you may like two or three, I'm not sure. Every agent is a little bit different. Um, but the, the book proposal is the key to success in the nonfiction world. Okay. Bob, let me ask you this. Uh, another truism that floats around town these days is that it is becoming more common to sell the movie rights to a book than a spec screenplay. I remember way back in the days of the writer's strike, you know, there were unemployed writers and we were busy writing spec screenplays. And then there was a flood of them on the market and, and the world of movie making changed. Uh, the character of movies changed because writers were writing what they wanted to write instead of what they were assigned to write. But what what about these days? Is that true that it, that if uh, if somebody has a story, they should actually write it as a book rather than a spec screenplay? I don't really handle screenplays, so I think Paul could answer that better than I. Yes, um, okay. I I, well, I will I will sell movie rights to books that I've had published, but I don't handle screenplays. And those do get picked up. I mean, All the time. You know, movie right. Okay. Um, no, so no, no, no. The way I like to talk about this is that Hollywood wants somebody else to say yes before they say yes. And the yes that they <laughs> most like to hear about. So does the, NASA. Okay. Far, the yes that they most <laughs> like to hear about is a yes from a book publisher or a comic book and graphic novel publisher. Okay. Virtually every movie that you're going to see in the movie that you have seen in the past 10 years in the movie theaters and that you're going to see in the future is based on something else. There are very few successful original spec screenplays anymore. Hollywood never, hardly, I don't want to say never, but hardly ever says yes to a spec script anymore. The days that you're referring to are long gone. <laughs> They're risk averse and very wary and very uh, shy about uh, taking on a spec script. They would much rather be told that this is a screenplay if the author is 
versatile enough to write both the manuscript version and the screenplay version. This is a screenplay based on a book that has been or is going to be published by a major publisher, Random House, Simon & Schuster, et cetera. Getting Hollywood interested in a self-published book, as they say in Brooklyn, forget about it. (laughs) It has to be a book that's published by a major publisher because what Hollywood is interested in is that there's already been an established or there's going to be an established market and um, a market awareness for the book for the, and then, then the movie. We're back to the platform again. Yes, of exactly. course. Well, here's something I want, and I'll direct, Bob, I'll direct this at you, and 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 then I would encourage uh, the rest of you to possibly comment because I, this also verges on the experiences that Cheryl has had, and I know that the, the types of projects that Paul has sold. But one of the things that strikes me about today's marketplace is the impact that the cable series has had on not only the movie form but also the literary form and i'm what i what i'm what it it harkens back to is i remember reading about back in dickens day there were his books that were published a chapter at a time in the newspaper and then there were people actually waiting on the docks for the mail boat to show up uh, so they could read the latest episode and it strikes me that a cable series is so much more has so much more depth than a feature because you know it's like the they, well, again I'm dating myself Reader's Digest convent, condensed version but but a cable series doesn't have to be condensed you've got you've got really long character arcs and the thing that really impresses me is that when I'm done binging a cable series and I know that it's the last episode. I miss those people. Mm-hmm. Okay. I, I don't miss them when I walk out of a feature film. I might be impressed by the performances, but but Bob, how does how how does a cable series get sold? And how does that relate to, let's say, a novel? I'm going to turn that one over to Paul again as well. <laughs> uh, I'm so, sorry to put it all on you, but I—that's not something that I, I that I really handle. Okay, so so it's it's not so in, epic, you, in, in your world. Novel. Think of um, the book that the Game of Thrones is based on, for example. Okay. Uh, by the way, when you're talking about cable, Gerald, I assume you're also talking about streaming, like Netflix, Hulu, Amazon oh, Prime, yeah. etc., oh, yeah. as opposed to cable. Pay, pay cable like HBO or Showtime. HBO and Showtime, you can't binge watch. It's one week, and then you wait, and you watch the next episode the next week. Yes, I know. <laughs> binge watch. Or binge watch, of course, if people want to do that. Or they can you know, spread it out at their, at their own pace. Um, but the, the, the structure, the, epi- the, the ability to have multiple episodes and tell the story over a long period of time is, I assume, what you're getting at. Yes, and absolutely. So it just, just depends on the material. There's some material where the story is told with a beginning, middle, and end and can easily uh, be adapted from the book to a two-hour or so uh, feature film. There are many other stories where um, much longer amounts of time to to truly develop the characters and develop the story and eventually, hopefully, come to a satisfying ending uh, is necessary. So the answer to your question is basically it depends on the material more than anything else. Okay, okay. And uh, got some, yes, yes, go ahead. Bring up a point too, like, again, getting back to the idea of a different medium, when you're looking for something that's gonna be told on a visual medium, um, like as a developing series, like like as Paul said, Game of Thrones, you know, is is a great example. Also, I would cite something like Westworld, which is, mm-hmm. you know, which was based on Michael Crichton's story and his film that he did in the early '70s. But a, a, a narrative like that, I think a lot of uh, 
what would be appealing as a series for cable is something that can be expanded upon. And it's got a lot of um, tethers that can be, you know, expanded out over a series of, um, over a, a series, a number of years. So you look at something like Westworld that started in the park Westworld, the storyline, it's expanded out since then into war world. And then they had the medieval world and now they're in the future world. And uh, so it's it's something that I think the more opportunities a, a, a narrative has to grow and expand as a series over time, that's going to make it inherently very appealing. Whereas you look at something like a like Big Little Lies, which in its, in and of itself was a fine series, but there's not much more they can do with that beyond the two seasons that they've already done. So I think it, it you need to look at how how much, how expansive is the material on its face? So we're, we're creating a world and that, that, you know, Paul mentions Game of Thrones. And one of the things that strikes me, actually, this is something I thought about recently um, about young adult fiction. And, and, you know, of course, Harry Potter being an, an example. But if you think about queen readers, and the fact that they're just entering adolescence and many of them are feeling socially isolated. They, and if they're, if they're readers, they <laughs> maybe even more so, but the fact that the, that the book represents a world that they can escape into that, that is manageable, that is not that, that, that where they may feel protected and one of the things I think you find striking in that literature is that the bullies in that world look a lot like the bullies in the real world. <laughs> and, and, and it's even been said that kids can build character and confidence by having read those books. And I just think that's very cool. Now, we've got some audience questions coming in here, and I'm just going to throw these out. And... Um, so we'll, we're going to enter a free-for-all session here of what is the wow factor that captured your attention from a previous pitch? Does a specific example come to mind of a great pitcher query that caught your attention? I can take one. If you, or I can. Go for it, Paul. The wow factor for me is the uh, two things, actually. The expertise of – this is in the nonfiction world. The expertise of the pitcher, something uh, about the uh, uh, person her, himself or herself, um, says to me, "Wow, this is the the expert, the maven, who can really uh, speak authoritatively on the topic, and has the ability to convey his or her message." in a compelling way. That's the wow factor for me. Cool, cool. Well, you know, I think it was Stephen Kennel, again, I'm dating myself, who said, uh, a good story badly pitched sounds like a bad story. <laughs> so it, uh, you really have to pay attention to that synopsis. And uh, not not all writers of books are, are uh, start out as good synopsis writers, right, Bob? <laughs> not every query you get for is, is uh, self-evident that it's a good uh, good property. The great majority of what I receive is not wonderful. <laughs> wow, you can put that one on a billboard. <laughs> and okay, what, here's another question. What, what happens is yeah, yeah, go ahead. When, when when you covered nonfiction in terms of fiction, it's the voice that comes through. Does, are you compelled to keep turning pages? And does that happen right away? If it doesn't happen by page 50 or 60, it's way too late. It's, it really has to happen right away. I had one author say, well, if you got to page 100, you would have seen that. I said, who's going to get to page 100? If I get 10 submissions a day, editors probably get 50. And so something has to capture you immediately. And what is it? It's usually the voice in that book that just said, oh, I want to know more. I want to know more about these people. 
Very cool. Very <clears throat> cool. So what do you predict to be hot? Trends and stories that agents are looking for? Uh, the, the, the questioner says mermaid romance, zombies, <laughs> historical <laughs> fiction set in the 1800s. Uh, what's the pulse of the marketplace? What can I write tomorrow? And that'll be a bestseller, guys. The last thing you want to do is write to whatever is hot today. Yeah. Because by the time your book is published, 18 months from the time the agent first takes it on, mm -hmm. whatever trend that exists today is something else. Never, <laughs> ever, ever write the trends. Right I can see we got time. unanimity on this one. <laughs> this one. So the might it be right, authors write to their heart? The author has to write what he's passionate about. There you go. Yeah. Ken Follett asked me once, what do you think my next book should be? And I said, whatever you want it to be. <laughs> Your audience is there. He was worried when he did his first nonfiction book that that wouldn't sell. Mm -hmm. uh, and it sold... Uh-oh. Yeah, yeah. Uh-oh. I think that one was about that book was about the uh the rescue, the um re rescue in what was it? Middle East, Iran. Incredibly well because we're back. There he is. There we go. <laughs> you were saying Follett's nonfiction book, that was the rescue, the one about that, the rescue? That, that was the Ross Perot book. Yes. And oh, was, okay. And it was wonderful. On Wings of Eagles, I think it was called. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. okay. um, and Gerald, one of the things I would say that is a trend right now, which I've debated, you know, it's any it's anybody's guess if it's going to be a trend two years from now. But I did a series uh, for this streaming platform, Quibi, um, that was actually the, the way it is uh, structured is they're, they're like serials um, that you have 10 minute, what they call episodes, uh, eight to 10 minutes, but it's part of a larger narrative. So basically it's the concept is you're taking a, what would be a two hour narrative for a feature and um, consolidating it down into what is called quick bites. That's actually the acronym for Quibi is quick ah. bites. <laughs> And it's the idea that people can I can digest these small little pieces of the story in eight to ten eight to ten minute increments on their phone. Now, one of the the things that makes Quibi attractive to the A list filmmakers that they're getting on board is that after a two year window on the streaming platform, they can then take that project and they own the IP that they can take that project somewhere else and repackage it as a narrative feature. So, so it's a twofold, um, has a twofold appeal to it. One is that if the, if the platform doesn't survive or once the, the uh, material has run its course, it can have a second life as, as another, you know, entity, you could take it to Hulu, you could take it to you know, Showtime, whatever, another platform to repackage it as a narrative feature. But also if someone has a story that, that lends itself to being told in almost like short chapters, then if you can get to what is inherently, you know, grabs your viewer about that chapter and then write it in a way that would, would make it a compelling eight to 10 minute bite of the story, that's an opportunity, I think, for writers to sort of rethink, do I have a, a story that would lend itself to this platform? And and see if it could uh, you know could be tailored in that way as, as as a means of another avenue of pitching that story. Well, yeah, we've seen that with audiobooks, and it's interesting. It's like short attention span theater. You know, while you're waiting for your well, it, w once you know we can re eat in restaurants again, but you know while you're waiting for your food to come, or you're waiting for the bus to come, or you're you got a su subway ride or something like that. But one of the things I think that, and I think Emily hit it on the head with what this what they're, what they're calling whisper sync, where you can listen to the audiobook and then you stop. And actually, it'll mark your place in the Kindle, so you could pick it up from there. And I've often thought um, some of these kids will, you know, they'll start listening to a book on their on their smartphone because 
well, you know, they don't like to read, but they got to do a book report. Okay. And then they get hooked into the story and they find out, guess what? You can read a whole lot faster than you can listen. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and they're engaged and suddenly, you know, or they might go back and forth between the, you know, the, the text of the book and, and the smartphone. So, yeah, I, you know, delivery systems really do affect content. You know, and we had red dramas in the 30s, and then, you know, we had talkies and movies, and, and everybody thought, oh, um, oh, oh, you know, maybe uh, uh, you know, t t television's going to replace the movies. Well, it didn't. You know, um, so I, I, don't, I don't know who's growling here, but um, I <laughs> hope your breakfast didn't disagree with you. Um, I don't have a dog. <laughs> Well, I do, but they don't sound like that. That's for sure. So let me ask you this. We got another question from uh, a uh, an audience member. What might be a turnoff in a pitch? What might one never want to do? I don't know. That, that's a tough one. Terrible writing. Terrible, Terrible writing. Terrible writing. So uh, <laughs> grammatical errors, misspellings, uh uh, sentence fragments that don't look deliberate, perhaps. Uh, we, can, we can certainly permit some of those if the author intended them. Um, too long? I have my uh, pet peeves as well. A couple things. Uh, telling me that you're the next, uh, pick your writer of choice, Ernest Hemingway. Right. Or telling me that you're the next uh, whatever. Or... Uh, telling me that this book is going to sell billions of copies. Yeah. Okay. We get that, don't we? <laughs> that or, that would, or that it would make a great movie. That's probably a bit Absolutely. presumptuous, right? Okay. Same, same way, you know, yeah. tone down your ego is my best advice for what you should uh, not do. Well, and, when, the, and when you make multiple submissions, don't show all the agents in the two column. Uh -huh. <laughs> Those I just immediately delete. I, so okay. do I. I totally agree. Okay. <laughs> and uh, other pet peeves, uh, dear agent. It's not so hard to spell my name. It's only four <laughs> letters. <laughs> um, or I, I bet you they butchered the Forio far more than Levine. <laughs> <laughs> it started well, here. It started here with Donofrio. <laughs> I just remember my first name. I don't even care about Levine. Just put Dear Paul, and I'm happy. Dear Paul, and you're, and you're good. Okay. Yeah. But see, and, now uh, I can remember your license plate, so I won't forget it. Or <laughs> you a letter with, I'm writing to you because I'm looking for a literary agent to sell my book, and I'm hoping you're the one, or something like that. Mm. Duh. Not too catchy. Yeah. We don't need, I don't need the introduction. Or I found you in the guide to literary agents, and I'm writing to you because. Don't need any of that stuff. Just yes. the, the the hook and what used to be called the elevator pitch. Uh -huh. You've only got thirty seconds for this this right. person. You know, right. or in the case of a query letter, three paragraphs. Yeah, yeah. Oh, three. Well, oh. three. Okay. Okay. Well. Also, I think, you know, if you were to tell me that you're the next Hemingway, that would be a turnoff because I feel as though Hemingway did a lot for print journalism. I, you know, newspaper writers should not have written like Edith Wharton, okay? But if there was an Edith Wharton writing fiction that read Hemingway and said, no, my sentences can't be any longer than 20 words or two independent clauses I can't use any more than words of three syllables, you know, I think there might have been some stylists that got their careers squashed because that guy just felt everything should be simple. That's my personal opinion. I don't know. Now, do agents ever encourage their writers to change their style? Right? I, I won't say, it would be generous to say dumb it down, but it does seem like some famous writers that I know, their writing got a little bit more spare as they went on. Have you noticed that, or am I just dreaming? Bob? I'm not sure of the answer there. Okay. I mean, it seems to be 
Crichton's work got a little bit more, maybe the grade level got a little bit lower as his books went on and after maybe there was a Jurassic Park made and maybe CAA might have been pushing him to go to a brighter, broader audience or am I just making that up? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, if I can say, and this is, you know, maybe this was just my experience, but when I read Jurassic Park, I, I appreciated the fact that I could actually follow and understand what he was talking about. So if he dumbed it down for people of my, um, you know, of, of my level, then I appreciate that because it, it made it an enjoyable read for me that I didn't feel like somebody was talking over my head in such um, technical terms that I couldn't grasp what was being said. Um, but uh, but at the same time, I think it is a balancing act because you don't want your audience to feel like you're pandering to them either. Like you're you're talking down to them or talking purposely talking to them like they're stupid. So it's a it's a fine line to walk between letting them know that you appreciate their intelligence, but also you you bring them into a world that that maybe isn't germane to what they know. And in the I think editor can help you there. That's also very 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 true. It's it's a balancing act or a fine line to walk to find the right level. You know, even though, even if you're a PhD and a world-renowned expert on your topic, uh, to find the right level so that you're writing to and not down to your reading public is crucial. I agree. The ability, again, the ability to tell or, or explain your topic in a compelling way, that's the key. Mm -hmm. It absolutely is. Guys, I have to leave because I've got to set up a conference call, but thank you very much. I enjoyed it. You guys have been very generous. Bob, Cheryl, Paul. They don't have to thank, go. But thank I you so much. <laughs>